Welcome. We're looking at Sartre today, or Satwa, and his view of existentialism and the human condition. And he defines it very quickly on that subjectivity must be the starting point. He looks at different kinds of existentialists, Christian existentialists. He talks about Jaspers, which you could put in there as well, uh, Kierkegaard or Dostoevsky. And on the other hand, atheistic existentialists, who include Heidegger and the French existentialists, including himself. But what he thinks they all have in common is they believe that existence precedes essence, or, if you prefer, that subjectivity must be the starting point. So he asks the very question I would ask, well, what does that mean? So he considers, for example, the making of some object that's manufactured, a paper cutter. When the paper cutter is made, the uh, artisan, the crafter, has some idea in mind, and he makes the paper cutter according to that method of production, and it has its use. That's what it does. So he says, uh, thus the presence of the paper cutter or book in front of me is determined ahead of time. And that's going to be one of his concerns is uh, not being determined, having a certain kind of free will where you're, where you're uncaused. And that's what makes you have that subjectivity. If you didn't have that uncaused will, you wouldn't be subjective. You'd be just a determined objective thing like a manufactured object, in this case a paper cutter. So therefore, let us say that the paper cutter essence, that is the ensemble of both the production routines and the properties which enable it to be both produced and defined, precedes existence. So the concept of the paper cutter, what it is, is in the the maker's mind, and then he makes it. But he's going to argue that for the existentialist, existence precedes essence. It's the reverse of that. You uh, exist, and then you determine what you are. So for this kind of existentialism, I'm only going to look at this kind, even though he talks about uh, other kinds of existentialists. The atheistic uh, existentialists that he's talking about, the French existentialists and Heidegger, Say you exist, and then you determine what you are. You're the determiner of good and evil for yourself. Now, one problem with that, of course, is that you exist in some sense already in order to determine your, your existence, your essence. So what is it that exists? You, you, the, the fact that you can even do that says something about yourself, right? You, you're not a mineral or a vegetable. They don't have those options. Or, or in this case, he talks about a paper cutter or the book in front of him. You're the kind of thing that can make choices, and you make those choices out of your wants, and your wants are shaped by your beliefs about the world. So all of that's part of the package that comes with you when you're then saying, I'm going to determine my essence. So what are the parameters on determining your essence? You can't undo those things about yourself. Those are a given. Where'd they come from? How did you get those things? Not from yourself. So there's already here going to be a problem built in as he's going. You can't determine your own existence or your own essence. Both of those were handed to you. The things that you have within the parameters of your choices are not exactly what he's talking about. He's not simply saying you have free will. Everyone, well, not everyone, many, many people agree you have free will. He's talking about determining good and evil for yourself. But you already exist, and you can't be your own creator. That should be just... Uh, evident immediately why that's a problem. You can't exist to then create yourself into existence. You already existed. So we have that problem before us. What am I before we even come to the question of uh, essence? What does it be? What does it mean to be uh, someone who can determine one's essence? What does it mean to, to uh, exist at all? We have these questions. Now, can we simply start from the subjective starting point? Well, in one way, we always do. In one way, that's simply unavoidable. You start with uh, your experiences and your thoughts and your inner life, but you also don't start, stop there. And we're going to see if he wants us to stop there or not. Your inner life makes you realize there's also an outer life. Those go together because if there's no outer life, then there's no inner life. There's just what is. So the fact that I have an inner life of subjective experiences says, well, there's also something that's not my inner life, which is the outer uh, world. What is it? And where did I come from? Where did my inner life come from at all? So we're going to see that he doesn't, he doesn't really address that, start with that question, where did I come from at all? You just are, 
and now you determine yourself. So let's keep going and see how this comes out for him. So he, he moves from the maker of the paper cutter to God. That was always just going to be an analogy for God. He's not really concerned about paper cutters. When we conceive God as a creator, he is generally thought of as a superior sort of artisan. Now, maybe. This already uh, brings in some questions, right? This may be more like what Aristotle talked about, even there, not quite, because Aristotle's unmoved mover is not aware of the world. He doesn't make the world the way an artisan makes the world. He exists in perfection, and the world tries to become like him. So this kind of artisan might be more like a polytheistic god, um, making the things because God the Creator is not just an artisan. God the Creator brings things into existence, and by bringing them into existence, God determines their natures. So those two things go hand in hand. In contrast to this view, we'll call it dualism, which we find in Plato and Aristotle. The world exists, and the maker exists, and, and the maker fashions the world into what we see around us. So he quickly just says God the Creator, but those are two very different views, and I think he's... he's uh, not able to distinguish them very well, and usually his criticisms are of that second one, God the Maker. Uh, so a superior artisan. Whatever doctrine we may be considering, and, and incidentally, real quick before we go on, one of the things about God the, the Maker is that the material world's co-eternal with God in that case, but also God is not in complete control of the material world. It exists apart from him, and it has properties apart from him, which is usually how the dualist explains uh, suffering, that there's just part, something in matter that makes life hard. And so God's not actually in control of those things. And that'll be relevant for what he's looking at here in terms of how much is God actually in control of, or do we exist in some way apart from God? And that's why he ends up rejecting God. We don't really need God on that dualist version. So uh, whatever doctrine we'd be considering, whether one like that of Descartes or of Leibniz, we always grant that we always grant that will more or less follow under follows understanding, or at the very least accompanies it, and that when God creates, He knows exactly what He is creating. Thus, the concept of man is the in the mind of God is comparable to the concept of a paper cutter in the mind of the manufacturer. And following certain techniques and a conception, God produces man just as the artisan, following a definition and a technique, makes a paper cutter. Thus, the individual man is, in the, is the realization of a certain concept in the divine intelligence. So, this is important for us here. Will follows understanding. So, keep that in mind as we're going. Is that the case? Uh, you understand something, and then you act on it. You make choices. And so far as those choices are, are uh, intentional, right? You could, you could just have two things on the board and throw a dart and hit one, and then do it. But in so far as you're making an intentional choice... That's an act of the will, and it's because of your understanding. So he's going to question that. He's going to try to reverse that. In the 18th century, the atheism of the philosophers discarded the idea of God, but not so much for the notion of essence precedes existence. To a certain extent, the idea is found everywhere. We find it in Diderot, in Voltaire, and even in Kant. Man has a human nature. This human nature, which is the concept of the human, is found in all men, which means that each man is a particular example of a universal concept man. In Kant, the result of this universality is that the wild man, the natural man, as well as the bourgeois, are circumscribed by the same definition and have the same historic qualities. Thus, here too, the essence of man precedes the historical existence that we find in nature. So, there's a human nature that, that all humans share in common. That's why we can speak about them as the same thing. Otherwise, they're not the same thing. And he's saying that comes all the way down even to the philosopher Kant. Atheistic existentialism, which I represented in, is more coherent. It states that if God does not exist, and there's a lot of reasons he's taking that for granted. One of them is World War II and the devastation of World War II. Many people thought that simply proves atheism must be the case and that we're alone in the world. If God doesn't intervene in human affairs like that one, then we're alone. There is no God. And we have to go at ourselves and figure out what to do ourselves. So atheistic existentialism states that if God does not exist, there's at least one being 
in whom existence precedes essence, a being who exists before he can be defined by any concept, and that as being as man, or as Heidegger says, human reality. Now, that sentence doesn't follow, right? Uh, if atheism's true, then the second half doesn't follow from the first half, that there's one being whose existence precedes essence. But nevertheless, in his mind, it's an important connection, and it, it, it emphasizes something I'm going over in these lectures, which is that our view of what is real determines our view of what is good. And so he sees that connection here too, and he says, if atheism... If atheistic existentialism is true, then his view of ethics and the good life follows. Now, other atheists will take, it's not just theists who will take exception. Other atheists will say, no, that's not, it doesn't follow at all. My view, they would say, or, or whoever is speaking of ethics follows from uh, atheism. So that's why I said this is not a tight connection that actually shows a causal relationship or inference. But Nevertheless, it shows that pattern. He thinks this pattern is the case. And he thinks that there is no God, mostly because of the problem of evil. So, the problem here, though, is reflected in what he just said up here. And this is where words begin to be emptied of meaning when we contradict ourselves. He says up here, the universal human nature, which is what allows us to speak about different humans in different contexts across all of history that are the same thing in one sense, even whatever differences they have in other senses. But then here, still speaking about humans as a thing that we can distinguish from other things, he says they're the only ones that have existence before their essence. Well, then you wouldn't be able to speak about them across the board like that. They would just be a bunch of different things. And, and that's what comes out of empiricism. Uh, I mentioned uh, the atheistic extension of following from the problem of evil, but it also follows from his subjectivity, which is a kind of empiricism. There could be objective empiricism, more like what the scientific method does. He's doing subjective empiricism, where you just have experiences, individual experiences. That's all there are. And any concepts you put together are arbitrary based on your experience. And we might happen to put some similar concepts together so we can talk to each other, but it's all just conventional, culture and convention made by our culture. It's not something real. There's just those individual experiences. And so you couldn't speak then about there being something called human nature that exists apart from the individual experiences. Then you're going to not be able to speak about the human reality or humans existing before their essence. At best, you might be able to say, I existed before my essence, and then we can cr cr look at that and see if that could be true. But you can't speak about these because of that empiricism. Empiricism means all knowledge is from sense data. And you're only getting information from the particular things you see. You don't ever get to a universal that applies to all. So this means that, first of all, man exists, turns up, appears on the scene, and only afterwards defines himself. Well, all right, what does it mean to define yourself? Man exists, so the word man means something. Later, when you define himself, it's within the context of what this word was. What In what way? Are you a mineral, a vegetable, an animal, a human, something else? So the, the parameters of defining yourself, it, it could mean something like this. When people tell kindergartners, you could be anything you want. Well, in one way, that's true. You, you could be a doctor, a lawyer, a uh, pro philosophy professor, uh, whatever you'd like to do in, in one sense and within parameters. It doesn't mean you could be a square circle. You could be a, a planet. So it depends what you mean. And, and he's leaning more towards things like that second one where you get to define the very existence of what you are. You're the determiner of good and evil. So it says, only afterwards will he be something. Well, wait. But it said man exists, which is the word be. So how does that work exactly? We're starting to see some contradictions show up. If you exist, then you are, be, and then you determine your essence, and then only then will you be. And he himself will have made what he will be, although he already was. So we're getting into some problems here. 
Thus, there is no human nature, since there is no God. Now, I, I think in a way those two do follow. If there is no God, there is no human nature. Interestingly, one of the other existentialists, Dostoevsky, who I mentioned earlier, said something similar. If there is no God, all things are permissible. And Dostoevsky saw that as an argument for God's existence. But Sartre is not starting with the question of are there morals. He's simply starting with since there is no God. See how that's an uh, affirmation? Not if there is no God, since there is no God. There is no human nature. And, and why? Well, there's no, hum there's no God to conceive it. That's a very important piece. Going back up to what he said about the understanding preceding the will. God's necessary for there to be an understanding of what human nature is, to determine human nature, because God is the determiner of good and evil as a creator. But since there is no God, there is no determiner for good and evil, and anything is permissible, as Dostoevsky said. But, but where Dostoevsky thought that would be a terrible outcome, and he writes, for example, his book, Crime and Punishment, but what would that be like to live as if there were no standards? Sartre is saying, yeah. You could be anything. That's what the character in Crime and Punishment, Ross Kolnikoff, is wrestling with. Could you will murder to be correct? Could you simply, by an act of the mind, will it to be, to be okay? Um, and what he finds, essentially, is that, no, we have a human nature, and we can't will what is wrong to be right. All right, so keep going here. Man is nothing else but what he makes of himself. Such is the first principle of existentialism. Man is nothing else but what he makes of himself. It is also what is called subjectivity, the name we are labeled with when charges are brought against us. Now, again, this first line, we'll, we'll, when he says principle of existentialism, let's just take that to be the atheist existentialist, not the other ones like Dostoevsky. If there is no God, you can will yourself to do anything. The only reason you want to do it is because of human laws that might catch you and you have negative consequences. But if you can do it well without getting caught, you're the determiner of good and evil for yourself. Uh, put it this way in popular uh, lyrics, any way you want it, that's the way you need it. Or it's said this way sometimes, uh, do what thou wilt is the whole of the law. That's all, that's the only law there is. For we mean that man first exists. That is, that man first of all is the being who finds himself toward a future and who is conscious of imagining himself as being in the future. Man is at the start, a plan, which is aware of itself. So again, you're aware of yourself. Yourself is a thing that exists. What are you? Are you eternal? Have you existed from eternity? No, he just said you show up on the scene. So if I'm not eternal, but something's eternal, then what is eternal? But he says this, uh, interesting, he's aware of himself rather than a patch of moss, a piece of cat garbage, or a cauliflower. So he's not those things. He's a thinking thing who's aware of himself. But he says nothing exists prior to this plan. There is nothing in heaven. Man will be what he will have planned to be, not what he will want to be. Because by the word will, we generally mean a conscious decision, which is the subsequent, which is subsequent to what we've already made of ourselves. I may want to belong to a political party, write a book, get married, but all that is only a manifestation of an earlier, more spontaneous choice that is called will. So nothing exists prior to this plan. And yet he just said, man starts to exist, is aware of himself as a being in the future. So you, something does exist prior to that plan, or if nothing exists, so, so either this is a direct contradiction with what he just said, or it implies another contradiction. If nothing exists prior to this plan, then things start existing from nothing, an uncaused event. Being came into existence from non-being. So analyzing possible ways, what does it mean by nothing? Really absolutely nothing? Or no plan existed, but then it's just a uh, truth. No plan existed prior to the plan. Well, yeah, but you were the kind of thing who can make plans. Cauliflowers 
uh, garbage, a patch of moss, aren't the kinds of things that make plants. So if existence really does precede essence, man is responsible for what he is. And that's one of the main things the existentialists want humans to do. Take responsibility for yourself. In one way, that sounds great. Say, yes, don't blame others. Take responsibility for yourself. But what they mean is take responsibility even for good and evil. Those are yours to define. Now, this different. It, this is an interesting difference. You can say this way. Those are yours to define or those are yours to figure out. Take responsibility for knowing what is clear. You should do that. But that's not what he's saying here. He's saying take responsibility to make them yourself. You're the determiner of good and evil. Thus, existentialism's first move is to make every man aware of what he is and to make the full responsibility of his existence rest on him. So that's what's great. Everyone aware of what they are, well, then that's the nature. All humans, you're talking to all humans. You're not talking to cauliflower or a patch of moss. So there's already some concept you have of humans before you come to them and tell them what they are and take responsibility for their existence, on, rest on them. Yeah, you're responsible to know what's clear to reason. For example, that something has existed from eternity and it's not you, which is built into the things he just said in the previous paragraph. You should know those, or this other side here. You should know those things. So some of these are just platitudes. When he says, take responsibility for yourself, hey, that's great. But does that follow from existential atheism? He hasn't made the case yet. And when we say that a man is responsible for himself, we do not only mean that he's responsible for his own individuality, but that he is responsible for all men. Well, wait a minute. Now you're into universals. All men. Does that include cauliflowers or not? How do we make a distinction? Well, that's by an act of reason, coming to see what all of these have in common. So we're still bound by reason as thinkers. When we find ourselves existing, we exist as thinkers, conscious, aware, able to make concepts by thinking and using reason. And humans really do have these things in common. It's not arbitrary. It's not just a convention. It's not as if in some other setting, half of what we call humans and cauliflowers all go together. No, those are always two different things. So the word subjectivism means, on the one hand, that an individual chooses and makes himself, and on the other, that it is impossible for man to transcend human subjectivity. All right, two things together, his doctrine here. You choose and make yourself. You determine what you are. Again, that's been ambiguous. Within what bounds? Does that mean you can be either a nurse or go into business, be an accountant? Okay, you choose which of those things you are. That's not what he means. He means what kind of being are you? And yet, he still distinguishes you from cauliflowers. And then the second one, it is impossible for man to transcend human subjectivity. There's nothing then transcending. There's only subjectivity. There's only that. You can't ever get beyond yourself. Now, this sentence is itself transcending human subjectivity. It's one of those self-referential absurdities, a self-contradiction, which are so problematic. In order to know if that's true, you'd have to transcend human subjectivity. And he makes a lot of statements like that, where if we hold him to it, if we hold him to saying there's only subjectivity, you can't make these other statements that you're making. They're not, they transcend your, your subjective experience. How would you know that's true? You can never experience it's impossible for man to transcend human subject subjectivity. Now, the second of these is the essence, essential meaning of existentialism. When we see that man chooses his own self, we mean that every one of us does likewise. But we also mean that by that, that in making this choice, he also chooses all men. Again, where are we getting these universals here? In fact, in creating the man that we want to be, there is not a single one of our acts which does not at the same time create an image of man as we think he ought to be. So to choose to be this or that is to affirm at the same time the value of what we choose, because we can never choose evil. We always choose the good, and nothing can be good for us without being good for all. All right, uh, what's going on here? We just went from there's only subjectivity to I'm like everyone else. We're all sharing human nature in common. And so when I say something's good for me, I'm implying that it's good for all humans. Yes, that's correct. But that's in direct contradiction to saying there's only subjectivity. 
And this is where, if you want to do existentialism, read Crime and Punishment. Ross Kolnikoff, the main character, is dealing with it, I think, more authentically, and I use that term on purpose, that's an existentialist term, dealing with it more authentically because he's trying to actually see, can we break the bounds of good and evil? Now, what he says here, we always choose the good, is correct. We always choose what we believe is good. We don't always choose what, we, what is actually good, but we always choose what we think is good in the moment. People always give counterexamples because sometimes you'll make a choice and there's immediately bad consequences. And you say, oh, I knew I shouldn't have done that. And no, if that's true, then in the moment you wouldn't have chosen it. So he's right. We always choose what we think is good. And he's also right. Nothing could be good for an individual that's not also good for all humans because we all share human nature. But none of that follows from the individualism that he's arguing for. This is why it's important to say, okay, not every view is true. Just because somebody who is in some ways uh, very smart says something, it doesn't follow that it's true. And he started off by saying, uh, atheism is true, therefore this view is true. And say, no, that doesn't follow. And we can actually even reverse it by saying, but this view is not true, therefore your atheism is not true. And by atheism, he means only material things exist. That's all there is. Although he also, that other sentence says, nothing exists before subjectivity. So maybe he's saying things come into existence from non-being. All right, so it says, if on the other hand, existence precedes essence, and if we grant that we exist and fashion our image at one and the same time, the image is valid for everyone and for our whole age. Thus, our responsibility is much greater than we might have supposed because it involves all mankind. So precisely because you, when you take responsibility for yourself and what you think is good, that then sets it also for everybody. That's a big responsibility. And with, with responsibility, uh, you have to take uh, the, think about the implications of it. So our responsibility is much greater than we might have supposed because it involves all mankind. Again, where are we getting this universal from? If I'm workman and choose to join a Christian trade union rather than to be a communist, and if by being a member I want to show that the best thing for man is resignation, that the kingdom of man is not of this world, I am not only involving my own case, I want to be resigned for everyone. Now, this is a good point. Take responsibility for your view because when you make a choice, you're implying that choice is true for everyone. Don't do this thing where you say, well, that's my truth and you have your truth. And it's interesting, he's not allowing people to get away with that, even though he emphasizes subjectivity. There's not your truth and someone else's truth. There's just truth. It is what it is. And when you say, this is the truth, and whether it's Christianity or communism, and at least he notices those are not the same thing. You can't be both. Uh, then when you make that choice, you think that's true for everybody. Take responsibility for that. Don't, don't try to get out of it by saying, well, you could have your truth and I have my truth. That doesn't work. Even for the existentialist, that doesn't work. So to take a more individual matter, if I want to marry, to have children, even if this marriage depends solely on my own circumstances or passion or wish, I'm involving all humanity in monogamy and not merely myself. Therefore, I'm responsible for myself and for everyone else. I'm creating a certain image of man in my own choosing. And choosing myself, I choose man. So it's interesting here because when we look at later postmodernists, they'll use this, especially when we get into sexuality. What is the standard? Why monogamy as a standard for sexuality? Who determines that? So although he is arguing here for all mankind, others will try to loosen that up. That's why I said this claim over here about atheistic existentialism. Not everyone will agree what he thinks follows from that. Because Although he'll want to say this, what he say, others will break that and say, no, you choose that. Others choose differently. Each one does what they want. And there are no standards. That's more like what Roskolnikov in Crown Punishment tries to do. And he, he finds out he can't do it. This helps us understand what the actual content is of such rather uh, grandiloquent words as anguish, forlornness, despair, and you will see it's all quite simple. Anguish. The existentialists say at once that man is anguish. Suffering. It's very interesting to see they start with that. The subjectivity, they start with the individual experiences, and, it's, and that's also where Buddhism starts in its first noble truth. All is suffering. 
And there's some similarities. And many existentialists either are first influenced by Buddhism or are also Buddhists. Um, you just realize life is suffering. It's filled with suffering, anguish. And what this means is the man who involves himself and who realizes that he is not only the person he chooses to be, but also a lawmaker who is at the same time choosing all mankind as well as himself, cannot help escape the feelings of his total and deep responsibility. And that produces that kind of anguish. You're responsible for what you do. Now, I think you could put that, you could, you could affirm that and say, yeah, you are. You're responsible for knowing what is clear to reason. Of course, there are many people who are not anxious, but we claim that they are hiding their anxiety, that they are fleeing from it. Certainly, many people believe that when they do something, they themselves are the only ones involved. And when someone else says to them, what if everyone acted that way? They shrug their shoulders and answer, everyone doesn't act that way. But really, one should always ask himself, what would happen if everyone looked at things that way? That's Kant and the categorical imperative. There is no escaping this disturbing thought. So that's where anxiety comes from. And that's interesting. Sometimes the uh, postmodern age is called the age of anxiety. And think about how many people struggle with anxiety. And part of the reason is because there are no standards. So you can't look to anything else. You just exist for a time and then you don't exist anymore. And how that would fill you with anxiety. So anguish is evident even when it conceals himself. This is the anguish that Kierkegaard called the anguish of Abraham. A Kierkegaard analyzes Abraham. You know the story. An angel has ordered Abraham to sacrifice his son. If it really were an angel who has come and said, you are Abraham, you will sacrifice your son, everything would be all right. But everyone might first wonder, is it really an angel? And am I really Abraham? What proof do I have? So in the context here, th this doesn't come out of nowhere in the story of Abraham. This is one of the problems in Kierkegaard's analysis. It's just like, out of the blue, God says, sacrifice your son. And, and it's God, angel. Um, so what's the context? Well, the context for Abraham in the biblical worldview goes all the way back to Genesis chapter 3 in the Garden of Eden, when their, their sins were covered by coats of skin. An animal Animals were killed to provide coverings for their sins. And you see that same sacrifice happen with Abel. And you see Noah offering sacrifices. And you see Abraham offering sacrifices. So you have this coming down to Abraham already that uh, sacrifices offered to atone for the sin, for sin. And ultimately, a human can't do it. In Genesis chapter 3, God tells Eve, the seed of the woman will crush the head of the serpent. Who is this seed of the woman? Interesting, not seed of a man and a woman, but seed just of the woman. That one will be the one who destroys evil. So there's already this combination of a promise that this has to be, the one who ultimately takes away sin is the seed of a woman, human, and it's through death. The death of this one that there's covering. So that's the context you come to when you think about Abraham and Isaac. Now Abraham is told, offer your son, your only son. The only son will, will die. But Abraham could also know that it's not going to be Isaac because Isaac himself needs a redeemer. So Isaac can't be the sacrifice for sin. And that God had promised that through Isaac, his he would have descendants as multiple as the sand the, as uh, numerous as the sand on the seashore. So Isaac, even if he is killed, won't stay dead. God could raise Isaac from the dead. So all of this context goes into this. is is not simply go murder your son. Murder and atoning sacrifice are different. So this is true when we look at Kierkegaard's analysis of it, but it's also true when we think about uh, Sartre here, just taking Kierkegaard's analysis of it. And you wonder these questions. So not only do you wonder, am I really Abraham? Is it really an angel? You also have to wonder, why is there death? Why does anyone have to die? Why does there have to be sacrifices at all? Abraham's been offering animal sacrifices. Why? Why would Isaac need to be sacrificed? So there's a lot of questions that you would wonder, and Abraham has answers for those already. Or what if there's a mad woman who has hallucinations and someone used to speak to her on the telephone and give her orders, and her doctor asked her, who is it who talks to you? And she answered, he says it's God. What proof did she really have that it was God? And that's a good question, right? A lot of people come along and they say, I have a new message from God. They say, well, what proof do you have is God and not someone else? Do you have any proof that God exists? Well, we could start with this. Something has existed from eternity and other things haven't. That's already getting us to the reality of creation. Not everything is eternal, but something is eternal. 
Now, I'm not being singled out as Abraham, and, not at, yet, and yet at every moment I'm obliged to perform exemplary acts. For every man, everything happens as if all mankind had its eyes fixed on him. So again, this is taking responsibility for yourself. Good. You should do that. And take responsibility for knowing and doing what is good. Don't act in a way that although you think it's good, it doesn't apply to everyone else. And then he also here talks about forlornness, a Heidegger, a term Heidegger was found, fond of. And we mean that God does not exist, and then we have to face all the consequences of this. There is no God. Don't, don't, don't say there's no God, and then still live as if life has objective meaning. It doesn't. There is no objective meaning, and that proves the anxiety and the forlornness. How empty is existence? So if you're going to say that, embrace it and live that way. Have some integrity. And that's one thing that's good about the existentialists. They want you to have integrity and not just play a game at this. If you think nothing is eternal, if you think there is no God, then live that way. So the existentialists is strongly opposed to a certain kind of secular ethics, which would like to abolish God with the least possible expense. So you get rid of God, but you still want all the benefits of theism. He says, no, we're not going to do that. So he says, I believe, is, uh, in other words, and this, I believe, is the tendency of everything called reformism in France. Nothing will be changed if God does not exist. We shall find ourselves with the same norms of honesty, progress, and humanism, and we shall have made of God an outdated hypothesis, which will peacefully die by itself. So now combining, uh, we, he'd, he'd been using Kant earlier, now he's using uh, Nietzsche. And it's interesting, the death of God. It's interesting how in, in Kant, which we'll look at in another video, but he just divides the world between the noumenal, which is being in itself, and the phenomenal, experience of being. And we can never go from our experiences to being in itself. You can never cross that. So because Sartre is in that line of Kantianism, why not just get rid of the noumenal? That's what he's doing. There's no need for it. You can't ever experience it. You don't know anything about it. So just get rid of it. You just have the phenomenal, just the experiences. So it's set up. He's keeping the Kantian ethics. Do what you could universalize and getting rid of the noumenal, which Kant didn't need either. The existentialist, on the contrary, thinks it is very distressing that God does not exist because all possibility of finding values in a heaven of ideas disappears along with him. There can be no longer a priori good since there is no infinite and perfect consciousness to think it. Nowhere is it written that God exists, that we must be honest, that we must not lie, because the fact is we are on a plane where there are only men. Dostoevsky said, if God doesn't exist, everything would be permitted. That is the very starting point of existentialism. Indeed, everything is permissible if God does not exist, and as a result, man is forlorn. So you can't anymore rely on God for your ethics. You have to make them up for your Self, and that's what makes you a human. You're no longer an infant relying on a parent to tell you what to do. You do it because you think it's good. However, he says, there is no more a priori good. Good is what you make of it. So when he says things about being honest and having peace, someone else could choose the others and make them the good. You can no longer make excuses for yourself. And one way you might make an excuse is simply by saying, well, God told me to do it. So that's why I did it. That's an excuse. You can no longer do that for yourself. Now, I don't think that if God exists, it follows that you would have an excuse. In fact, it would be the opposite. You're inexcusable for not knowing God. But he wants you to take responsibility for yourself. And on this, I think he's absolutely right. If you believe nothing is eternal or only matter exists, then you're, you have to embrace it. And it, it Produces that anxiety and that forlornness. If existence really does precede essence, there is no explaining things away by reference to a fixed and given human nature. Although we've already seen, although we've already been speaking about all mankind, so you think there is some human nature that distinguishes them from cauliflowers. In other words, there is no determinism. Man is free. Man is freedom. And I told at the beginning, I said that's one of the most important values here. On the other hand, if God does not exist, we find no values or commands to turn to which legitimize our conduct. So in the bright realm of values, we have no excuse behind us, nor justification before us. We are alone with no excuses. That proves the anxiety and forlornness. Ennui. 
That is the very idea I shall try to convey when I say that man is condemned to be free. Condemned means he did not create himself, yet in other respects is free. Because once thrown into the world, he is responsible for everyone. You might remember that from the Doors lyrics. Into this world, you're thrown. Into this house, you're born. And there's nothing to refer to. It's like you wake up on an island and you're like, how did I get here? Where am I? What am I? And you can't know anything besides your own experiences. The existentialist does not think that man is going to help himself by finding in the world some omen by which he must orient himself. So it's interesting here, right? He's thinking only of special revelation. That's the example from the mad woman who gets a phone call or from Abraham or from an omen. God says in some voice to you or gives you a written thing like the Bible, do this. He doesn't ever consider that the world itself reveals God. The very fact that you, you wake up on a desert island existing, something's already existed. Something existed from eternity. So he only contrasts special revelation when, when we never know which one is which. There's lots of special revelations. But he never considers general revelation. The, the fact of existence itself reveals that something is eternal, and it's not me. He already says it's not you. So what is it? But if it is taken to mean the future is recorded in heaven, that God sees it, then it is false. And that's the other thing he wants to argue against is determinism. He wants free will to be this uncaused free will. And if God exists, then it isn't. And that, that's not the case either. We're not going to look at that now. But you could have uh, God and free will. Actually, things will be as man will have decided they are to be. Does that mean that I should abandon myself to quietism? No. First, I should involve myself, then act on the new saw. Nothing ventured, nothing gained on the old saw. Nor does it mean that I shouldn't belong to a party, or rather that I shall have no illusions and shall do what I can. For example, suppose I ask myself, will socialization as such ever come about? I know nothing about it. All I know is that I'm going to do everything in my power to bring it about. So, so remember, I mentioned communism earlier. He's, he's uh, committed to that. We've looked at Marx elsewhere, so these two are combined. I'm committed to that. In, in, in contrast, each time he's talked about Christianity, now quietism, he's talked about otherworldly Christianity. Leaving this world, the, next, the best life is in heaven, the next world. And so he's contrasting that with making things better in this life. Marx did the same thing. And that's partly on religions, partly on Christians who have done that. They've said that. They haven't made meaning of this life. But it's also on Marx and Sartre because they should be able to see the meaning that's in this life and how it reveals God. So we have a false dichotomy here between materialism and otherworldliness. Those aren't the only two options. It could be that the created world, created by God, reveals who God is. And so you're not trying to escape it to the next life. You're trying to understand it. So according to this, we can understand why our doctrine horrifies certain people. Because often the only way they can bear their wretchedness is to think circumstances have been going or have been against me. What I've been and done doesn't show my true worth. To be sure, I've had no great love, no great friendship, but that's why, that's because I haven't met a man or woman who was worthy. The books I've written haven't been very good because I haven't had the proper leisure. I haven't had children to devote myself to because I didn't find a man with whom I could spend my life. So there remains within me, unused and quite viable, a host of propensities, inclinations, possibilities that one wouldn't guess from the mere series of things I've done. Now for the existentialist, there is really no love other than that which manifests itself in the person's being in love. There is no genius other than one which is expressed in works of art. So here he's taking away these excuses. This person here is making excuses and he's saying, no, what you are her, and have done is you. Take responsibility for it. So this may be thought to be harsh to someone who hasn't, whose life hasn't been a success. But on the other hand, it prompts people to understand that reality alone is what counts. That dreams, expectations, and hopes warrant no more than to define a man as a disappointed dream as miscarried hopes, as vain expectations. So he's calling for action here against just dreaming, but also against heaven. So as a, uh, someone who wants you to get involved in socialism, he's saying make this world better. And by better, he means certain things about economic outcomes and economic and political life. And so that's interesting. That shows us his view of the good, but it's not consistent with his view that you can determine 
your own essence. You can determine good and evil for yourself. Because if that's the case, then you might say those things aren't good. And he would say, that's okay, take responsibility for that then. He thinks that doesn't work out in some way. But then that's still an argument about the nature of things, which is the inconsistency going on here. When all is said and done, what we are accused of at bottom is not our pessimism, but an optimistic toughness. If people throw up to us our work of fiction, in which we write about people who are soft, weak, cowardly, and sometimes even downright bad, it's not because these people are soft, weak, cowardly, or bad. Because if we were to say, if we were to say as Zola did, that, the, that they are that way because of heredity, the workings of environment, society, because of bio, biological, psychological determinism, people would be reassured. And that's one thing here. Unlike other, others like uh, Marx, for example, who says that you are what you are due to your economic condition, the existentialists want to say, no, you are what you are because of what you make yourself. You determine it. Don't put it on someone else. Take responsibility. There's no such thing as a cowardly constitution. This helps us understand what it means by um, create your essence. You're not a coward and then you act out of it. You made yourself one. So he says, what counts is total involvement. Some one particular action or set of circumstances is total involvement. And I think you can affirm that and say, yes, take responsibility. But you have to go further. Take responsibility to know what is clear to reason about yourself, about what is eternal, about God. Not doing that and, and just saying, well, we can't know. I have my truth. You have your truth. No, that's not uh, integrity. Get in, be involved, totally involved in knowing what you should know and acting on that. Be consistent between what you claim. For example, if you say there is no truth, there's just my truth and your truth. Well, what would it be like if you lived consistently like that? There are no standards. You, anything is right. If someone else thinks it's okay to do a violent act, then that's what they think. That's okay. They can do whatever they want. Have integrity. And it's called to integrity. I think we can affirm and say, yeah, that's good. We should have integrity. But if we had integrity, would we be able to believe existential atheism? And I've offered a number of criticisms throughout because we're, we're critically thinking about this to show, no, we can't. So existentialism defines us in terms of our actions. There is no doctrine more optimistic since man's destiny is within himself. It tells him that the only hope is in his acting and that action is the only thing that enables a man to live. And so you can see two ways to understand this, right? Have integrity. You might say you're a great person, but you don't live like one or a good person, but you sure aren't living like a good person. Or it could be taken, which he, he affirms it that way sometimes, but then he takes it this other way, which we've analyzed. Uh, you are whatever you want to be. You determine good and evil for yourself, which, which can't uh, be the case. You exist. You find yourself existing. You are something. What are you? Take responsibility for knowing what you are. Since you started to exist, something else existed before you. What was it? What has existed from eternity? What is it to be a good human? What is good for human nature? That enables you to live. And that's important here. He doesn't simply mean staying alive biologically. That is life itself, knowing those things. You should know those things and take responsibility because if you don't know them, there's no one to blame but yourself.